All right, take your Bibles. We've been in Proverbs as a church. We're continuing in Proverbs chapter 7. It's in the middle of your Bible. Usually you open up to the middle, you'll find Psalm. Just go to the next book over, which is Proverbs. Find chapter 7. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, my name is Mark Becton, and for many of you, you haven't seen me before because my family and I worship at the 830 service. But I have the joy of being one of the pastors here at Redemption Hill. And a joy to read scripture with you today from Proverbs chapter 7. We'll start by looking at verses 1 through 5. All right. God inspired Solomon to write this. And in doing so, he writes, My son, keep my words and treasure up my commandments with you. Keep my commandments and live. Keep my teaching as the apple of your eye. Bind them on your fingers. Write them on the tablet of your heart. Say to wisdom, you're my sister. And call insight your intimate friend to keep you from the forbidden woman, from the adulteress with her smooth words. All of Proverbs 7 is guarding the young man from the adulteress. And it's a, a timely word. I, I read this uh, some time ago from Kent Hughes. He writes the following from his own research. He said, recently, Leadership Magazine commissioned a poll of a thousand pastors. The pastors indicated that 12% of them had committed adultery while in the ministry. One out of eight pastors. One out of eight, and then 23% had done something sexually inappropriate. He continues, Christianity Today surveyed a thousand of its subscribers who were not pastors and found the figure to be nearly double. One out of four Christian men were unfaithful, and nearly half have behaved unbecomingly. And Hugh said he saw this recently. Hughes wrote this over 20 years ago. And in my conversations with pastors, in my conversations with men, I am fearful to say I don't know if the statistics have improved. So that is why it is important that we look at this passage, but not just for the adulteress and her wiles, not just for the adulterer and his. It's actually my hope that we can expand the face of temptation and see what the Father has provided in Proverbs chapter 7 as a help for all of us in the myriad of temptations that we face. But to do that, I need to do a couple of things. First of all, I need to broaden our eyes to various temptations. It's very easy just to focus on one, maybe the one in Proverbs chapter 7. And since it may not be your temptation, you can overlook its truths. Well, what would happen if we actually expanded it to see a myriad of temptations and also let you know this, when temptations come, they just don't come one at a time. Oftentimes they will come uh, multiple, multiples at once. So let me just help see if I can prime the pump and see if you can address any of these possible temptations. One could be coveting, specifically, wanting the spouse, job, family, income, or anything else someone else has. Or the temptation at work to work hard simply that you can have, as Rockefeller said, more. Or you just want benefits or you want fulfillment at work instead of finding fulfillment in Christ. Your identity through work instead of your identity in Christ. Your approval at work instead of your acceptance by Christ. Or to have a secure future because you have saved because of what you've earned at work instead of your security of your future in Christ. Or maybe the temptation of family. This is a strange one, but it's prominent. Uh, to meet every want and expectation of your family or to be seen as a good family by all the other families. Or the temptation of unforgiveness. Holding grudges and bitterness and justifying why you deserve to feel the way that you do. A few more. Prayerlessness. Because you're holding a grudge against God. 
Or you don't want him telling you how to do something or to not do something. Or what I call the catch-all drawer. You can just throw anything into this. And for this, it's any form of disobedience. Specifically, uh, there's more than one act of disobedience. It's when the father says to do and you say no. And the father says don't do and you say yes, I will. So right now, your mind may be swimming with a myriad of temptations that are a part of your life. But to understand how we can see this in Proverbs chapter 7, I think we first need to start with a brief theology of temptation. If we can see temptation as a whole, as a, as a theology, then we can have our eyes set as a good lens to look at chapter 7. So let me just start by asking you to put your finger where you are, but now find a New Testament book of 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians. It's the first letter that God inspired Paul to write to believers, the church in Corinth. And it's a very confrontational letter. They have succumbed to a myriad of temptations. And yet in this one verse in chapter 10, in verse 13, you, you get a brief summary, a good springboard for a theology of temptation. Here's what he says. <clears throat> no temptation has taken you that is not common to man. God is faithful and he will not let you to be tempted beyond your ability. But with the temptation, he will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. Right at the front, you understand that temptation is common to everyone. To understand why it is common to everyone, you need a backstory of Satan. And you have a brief backstory of him in Ezekiel chapter 28, verses 12 through 17. There it says that God created Satan to be the chief angel of all angels, and yet unrighteousness was found in him because he coveted, out of pride, he coveted God's control. He wanted to be in control, not under God's control. Also, he longed for God's glory to get all the accolade and all the recognition. He coveted that for himself. Therefore, unrighteousness was found within him and he fell. God cast him out. And we are introduced to him in Genesis chapter 3. Many of you may be familiar with the story of Adam and Eve where he tempts them. It's remarkable that he tempts them with the very things that are tempting to him. Control. Of all these things in this garden, you're only restricted from one. Why? Don't you want that too? Look how tasty it looks. And do you understand if you took this fruit of this forbidden tree, then you could see as God sees, know as God knows, you would be in control. You'd be equal with him. So he's basically tempted them. And they take the bite of forbidden fruit and digest more than just what they've eaten. They've taken now in Satan's nature and his end. Just as he is cast away, they are cast away, separated from God. And the nature? An appetite for lies. An appetite for sin. So with that said, uh, one of the things that we would think is that is it hopeless in this world of temptation to, to not succumb to it? That's the reason I love Romans chapter 6, verses 17 and 18, and Galatians chapter 4, verses 4 through 7. In those verses, it reminds us that Christ has redeemed us, his sacrifice. Right now, before Christ and our salvation, our master is our appetite and our appetite for sin. But because of Christ, because of his sacrifice, redeem means to purchase us out of the slave market. We're no longer a slave of the lies, no longer a slave of our sin. We now have a new righteous master in Christ and in his strength can say no. Can say no. Which then gives us a better picture again when you look at 1 Corinthians 10, 13. Look at it one more time. No temptation has taken you, overtaken you, that is not common to man. 
God is faithful and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. But with the temptation, he will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. So in Christ, we have a new master, so we shouldn't have the appetite for sin. If that's the case, then why does it still appeal to our palate? Why is there still the lure of temptation? Well, you learn this with Christ the night before he's crucified. In John chapter 17, he prays, and the whole chapter is his prayer. Eight times in this prayer, he reveals his aim for his prayer. His aim is that he, by his life, and that his followers, by their life, would know, see, and even display the glory of God. That's important to know when you see what he prays in John chapter 17, verses 15 through 17. Listen to this. Jesus is praying. He says, I do not ask, talking to the Father, that you take them, my followers, out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in the truth, your word is truth. So Christ has prayed that in salvation that you're not removed from a fallen world. And that suddenly you're not numbed to your sinful nature. But in those temptations, in this fallen world, you might know whom you are and all that you have because of Christ. Sometime in the next uh, year, the church year, September 23 through August 24, my, my aim is to teach an equip class on spiritual warfare. One of the seminal passages is Ephesians chapter 6, where it talks about the armor of God. And so often we forget that the armor of God is simply the covering of Christ. And all that's described in the armor of God is all that we have because we are covered in Christ. But how would we know that if we didn't face what Christ faced? And also to know the strength that we have in him when facing those temptations. In Hebrews chapter 2 verse 18 it says that Christ himself was tempted so that he may nurture, nourish us as we are being tempted. And in the closeness of Christ in those moments we get to know his nature by what is said of him in his word. And therefore, in those moments, grow even more like him. That's the word sanctify, conform to his likeness. So with all of that said, then how do we look at temptation in Proverbs chapter 7? Please see it as God's kindness. I know it's written in a way that seems to be more of a warning. There is kindness in a warning. But the Father has already covered you in Christ. You are still in the fallen world. And in his loving kindness in Proverbs 7, he's going to say, but let me just share with you how temptation may come to you. Let me give you an idea of what you're going to face. So from verses 6 through 27, we're going to look at six tactics of temptation out of the loving kindness of God to warn us. But then before we're finished, we'll look at the defenses that God puts in place so that we know we can stand in Christ. All right, so tactic number one. You find it in verses six and seven is simply this. Temptation looks for easy victims. Look at verses six and seven. For at the window of my house, I have looked out throughout my lattice. And I have seen among the simple, I have perceived among the youths, a young man lacking sense. This is what she sees, a simple young man lacking sense. The Hebrew words give you this picture. Simple simply means to be open to all impressions. Every day, every experience, fair game. I'm open. But more than that, when it says lacking sense, it talks about someone who lacks the willpower to say no. Not only are they open to every experience, when an experience is offered, it's an enthusiastic, sounds good. So that's why temptation just looks for the easy victim. 
And you and I understand that we don't want to be that. That's the reason we lock our cars, lock our doors. Thieves are, are lazy by nature. They just want to look for an open door. That's the reason we lock the cars, the doors to our house. Or even we'll put out uh, motion sensor lights so that if somebody walks toward the door, a light shines on them and scurries them away. Honestly, this is one of those moments in the heart and the direction of a message where you just need to ask the Father to shed light on the temptations that may be approaching so that you can guard your heart. Father, shed light. Is there a grudge in me with what someone has said, someone has done, and I feel as if it could never be forgiven? Father, shed your light on me. Am I coveting another job for reasons that are not from you? Do I want somebody else's family life because mine right now is so stressed? You can go through the whole thing, but ask the Father to shed light on any known and unknown temptations as we go through this because there are other tactics that may be at play. Like the second one. You'll find this one. It's temptation waits for some in verses 8 and 9. It says, passing along the street near her corner, taking the road to her house. In the twilight, in the evening, at the time of night and darkness. Now, this adulteress is assumed to be a prostitute. And prostitution in the biblical times was had two ends. One was for uh, profit, the other was for pagan religions. We'll find a little bit later in another verse, this prostitute is attached to a pagan religion. But regardless, the temptation tactic is, all she has to do is wait because he is walking her way. The uh, best way to describe this is my dad. My dad was a diabetic. My mom was a great cook, particularly of pastries. It was a horrible combination. <laughs> and uh, there was a time we were visiting them in Oklahoma. Mom, when we came, vis uh, baked and cooked all the sweets and put them in the refrigerator in the garage, and Dad was out there. I walked by, he motioned me over, and he said, son, watch this. And he just opened the refrigerator door. He looked like a child at Christmas. He reached in the bib of his overalls and pulled out a spoon. <laughs> he said, I keep this with me at all times. It tastes so much better when you're not supposed to have it. You know, that's the way temptation is. On some accounts, it just waits for you. Pornographic site just waits for you to click. Uh, the people that you are competing with in family, you know where they are on Facebook, so you just know where to look to see if we're doing as good as they are or to gloat if you're doing better. You can go through all these things of temptation. You, you know where to find the good gossip or to find the listening ear for the gossip that you have. You know where to go. It just patiently waits. The third tactic of temptation is that it markets others. So if you're not allured to it right now, just give it time. It will market you. You find this in verses 10 through 12. Look what it says. And behold, the woman meets him, dressed as a prostitute, wily of heart. She is loud and wayward. Her feet do not stay at home. Now in the street, <clears throat> excuse me, now in the market, and at every corner, she lies in wait. Multiple strategy of marketing, these are hers. One, she uses billboards. It's the way that she's dressed. That's in verse 10, verse 11. Utilizes talk radio and social media. She is loud and defiant. Verse 12, she employs the internet, posting her product in mul multiple places. It's in the street, now in the squares. At the corner, she lurks. Marketing. I think it was my son who directed me to an article. I didn't get a chance to read it. He just told me about it. 
of someone who had worked in the United States for several months was returning home but decided to leave with a parting article of his experience of the good and the bad of the United States. And one thing seemed to be a little bit of both. He said, the United States is the best at marketing. He said, I can go to Walmart because I need one thing and come out having purchased a basketball, suddenly thinking I have to have all of these things now. It's because how marketed it is. And if you go back to the root of the marketing of this woman, you'll find the word wily in her marketing. Now, the Hebrew word for wily simply means that she hid something that was bad behind what she was marketing. And honestly, to do that is simply to lie. Which gets us back to the best marketer of temptation there is, which is Satan. Jesus talks about this and talks about Satan in this. In John chapter 8, verse 44, this is what he says. He says of Satan, he was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth. For there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar and the father of lies. Which means he's behind every temptation. But if you haven't been reached out by the marketing, or maybe you have, what may hold you even more in the temptation is the fourth tactic. Temptation is sensual. It appeals to your senses. You find this in verses 13 through 18. Speaking of the prostitute, she seizes him and kisses him. And with bold face, she says to him, I had to offer sacrifices, and today I have paid my vows, a pagan religion. So now I have come out to meet you, to seek you eagerly, and I have found you. I have spread my couch with coverings, colored linens from Egyptian linen. I have perfumed my bed with myrrh, aloes, and cinnamon. Come, let us take our fill of love till morning. Let us delight ourselves with love. And if you missed the five senses, let me go through it again. In verse 13 is touch. She holds his face and kisses him. 14 and 15 is hearing. She seduces him with words. Verse 16 is sight. She gives him a picture of her bed. Verse 17, she says her bed is covered with perfumes. Now you have smell. And in verse 18, taste. She says, come, let's drink deep of love till morning. Several years ago, I heard the article talking of uh, movie theaters, finding a way to waft the smell of popping popcorn into the theaters. And it was uncanny because people in the middle of the most intense scene will just get up in a zombie-like state and head for it. <laughs> there's a powerful sense of our senses. And sadly, when temptation appeals to our senses and we take in our experience is like the popcorn. We have been drawn to it and took it in. But after a while, all we have is an empty bucket. All we have is emptiness. Which uh, then leads to the fifth temptation that could bring us back. Temptation becomes rational. It will reason with you. You find this in verses 19 through 21. Look what it says. For my husband is not at home. He has gone on a long journey. He took a bag of money with him. At full moon, he will come home. With much seductive speech, she persuades him. With her smooth talk, she compels him. Uh, there are two rationales that are used to reason with them. One is basically secrecy. And no one will know. You find that in verse 19. He, my husband, has gone on a long journey. We can do this secretively. The second rationale is, this is the best time to do it. In verse 20, it says, he will not be back till full moon. Uh, Old Testament scholars, Kyle and Delich said, it's probably the period of 14 days. So here's the reasoning of temptation. Do it 
because nobody will know. You can keep this a secret, but there's also an urgency in having to do it now. And it plays with you. But then verse 21 says, if those two rationales won't work, verse 21 says, with persuasive words, she led him astray. So there's more than just one rationale. And we don't know what those persuasive words were, but in my own wrestling with temptation, in others wrestling with temptation, I, each of us have a pretty good idea what they might be. So I put a short list together. We had reason to say, go ahead and do it. You deserve it. Go ahead and do it. You need it. You have the right. You have the ability. One time won't hurt. Go ahead and do it to protect yourself. Go ahead and do it to treat yourself. Do it. It's only fair. It's only right. Persuasive. But I love the Father and His kindness to us in Proverbs. In Proverbs 14, 12 and Proverbs 16, 25, it says the same thing. For the Father to repeat it is something He wants to really get in. And it simply says, There is a way that seems right to a man, but in the end, it leads to death. Guard your heart. Because the final tactic of temptation is extremely powerful. It hides the consequences. You find that in verses 22 through 27. Look what it says. All at once he follows her. As an ox goes to the slaughter. As a stag is caught, in, caught fast. Or, or till an arrow pierces its liver. As a bird rushes into a snare. He does not know that it will cast him. It will cost him his life. And now, O oh sons, listen to me and be attentive to the words of my mouth. Let not your heart turn aside to her ways. Do not stray into her path. For as for many a victim has she laid low, and all her slain are a mighty throng. Her house is the way to Sheol, going down to the chambers of death. Honestly, you would think that because she has had many victims and slain a mighty throng, that people would be aware of the consequences. But it's remarkable how all of these tactics together can easily blind you in a moment of the consequences at the other end. Uh, I experienced that in a lighter side several years ago. I was pastoring here in Richmond, and the men of my church, several of them said, why don't you go with us to Myrtle Beach? We'll play, play golf. I said, great. So uh, one night, a group of them had gone to the go-karts and came back and said, man, the go-karts were great. We could run them like NASCAR. We ought to do it tomorrow night. It sounded fun. So uh, we, we went, and there was about 12 of us, all in our 40s, along with a group of 12-year-olds. And wanting to make certain that we all raced together, we let the 12-year-olds go first. And that's when we heard the manager say, Now, this is not NASCAR. There is no bumping. There is no rubbing. There is no pressing someone to the wall. And I, I, I got nervous. In fact, it wasn't me. Other guys got nervous too because apparently the manager the night before didn't say that. So while I'm wrestling through, I probably shouldn't do this. Um, some of our guys went to the manager. And they came back and said, it's okay. Somehow they were able to convince this 19-year-old manager <laughs> that uh, for every bump or rub we did, he would get two extra dollars. I didn't know that. They just said, it's okay. And I wasn't okay with it because I'm their pastor. And I'm picturing in my mind, what am I going to do if I start getting aggressive at this and they kick me out of the park and I'm their pastor? So now I'm walking toward the cards. Remember I said temptation was waits for those who walk toward it? I was walking toward the cards. Remember about the rationale? I began to reason in my head. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to get the lead card. I'm going to go so fast that nobody can touch me. That way I don't have an issue. 
So I get in the lead cart and I take off and it's great. I'm in the lead, but I get bumped from behind. I, I don't let it jar me. Just take tighter turns, taking tighter turns. Doesn't matter, somebody clips my back and slides me into the bank. And that's when temptation becomes sensual. <laughs> Because it's the sound of the engines, it's the smell of the track, it's the sight of the guys going past me. They're all going past me. And now the adrenaline has taken over, and I am in it, I'm going after them. I bump one, rub one, I push one into the wall, and I finish third. <laughs> and guess who was first to get in line for the next race? And I had completely forgotten what had frightened me before of the consequences. It's a lighter side, but it does show how temptation has methods. I mentioned Ephesians chapter 6, the armor of God. It means the covering of Christ and all that we have in him. If you go back to that chapter, you'll see why the Father covers us with Christ, with this armor, that we may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. The word schemes that is used there is a New Testament word, methodia. I say it out loud because you can hear how we get our English word methods from it. Satan is not just a brute beast who just wants to bite who comes by. There is scheming methods so that as a follower, your life will not do what he would despise. See the glory of God. Experience the glory of God. Display the glory of God. So, when you go through these tactics like this, and in the chapter it almost sounds hopeless, as if there is no hope to withstand this. That's the reason I love the structure of the chapter. The chapter begins with the first five verses which actually gives us our defenses for all of these tactics that come. So let's go back to our first five verses and conclude there. Verses 1 through 5 it says, now remember this, God has inspired Solomon to write this, and Solomon says, my son, but just for its impact to all of us. Remember what the Father says to us about his word? He breathed it into existence by his spirit. And remember how we are told to pray to him in Matthew 6, call him our father. So just for a moment, picture God saying this to you. All right? Because he did write it for your benefit and his glory. Having said that, hear the father say, my son, my daughter, keep my words. Treasure up my commandments with you. Keep my commandments and live. Keep my teaching as the apple of your eye. Bind them on your fingers. Write them on the tablet of your heart. Say to wisdom, you're my sister. You're my brother. And call insight your intimate friend. Do this to keep you from the forbidden woman, the forbidden man, from the adulteress, the adulterer, the temptation with all his or her smooth words. Verse 5 is, is the beauty here because it's a hinge verse. When you've read verse 5, it carries you to look at the tactics that are coming. But it's a hinge verse. It means it can swing back to verses 1 through 4 to show you that the Father has already provided you all that you need for the tactics that you will experience. You just need to see what he has said. So let's... Let's break apart verses 1 through 5. And I love the verbs here. Verse 1 says, God says, keep my words. What words? All my words. Verses 1 and 2 says, treasure up my commandments with you. Keep my commandments and live. Temptation leads to death. God's word, his commands lead to life. Also in verse 2 says, keep my teaching as the apple of your eye. Some believe this picture of apple of your eye means the pupil. And you and I know the light is able to come in through the pupil. that actually allows us to see. And the father says, 
If you want to see what is true about you, if you want to see what is true about this circumstance, look at it through the lens of my word. Because remember, this world is under the rule of a liar, Satan, who happens to be still under the authority of God. So any temptation that we face has to be permitted by God. And if God has permitted it, he has purposed it. And he has purposed it that we might know Christ more intimately and what is true even in this moment that we're in. Look at it through the lens of Scripture and know what is true. Uh, verse 4, he says to see wisdom as a sister. Uh, this, is, this is really great. Uh, the word sister here for the Hebrew uh, would also be used of the wife. So going to the context of this verse and dealing with the theme of an adulteress, he said, if you don't want to be tempted by an adulteress, then be infatuated. Let your wife fill your eye. Look to her. Be infatuated with her, and you won't even see the adulteress. Uh, let me just finish with this. Uh, several years ago, I had a, an enjoyable conversation with a man named Tom Elif. Uh, he'd been a pastor for years prior to that. He was a missionary, then being a pastor for decades. And then in, in his, his latter stint in ministry, he uh, was president of the International Mission Board. I think it was uh, sometime before retirement. He was talking to me about uh, his mentors. Now, he was in his late 70s. And his mentors were in their 90s, and a couple of them, uh, uh, even a hundred or more. And one of them actually drove his Corvette to see Tom. I, I coveted just for a moment. You know, to be that age and to have that, that'd be great. But then Tom, Tom told me about one of his mentors who had passed. He was a, a pastor who had become an evangelist. And uh, God used him in a tremendous way wherever he went. But one day, Tom was surprised to hear that his mentor had fallen morally with a woman. So Tom quickly picked up the phone to call and said, what happened? He said, Tom, uh, I was preaching from location to location, and though the people couldn't see it, I was basically preaching the same sermons improving them a little bit, but they were just the same sermons. It looked great on the outside, but on the inside, I, I was vulnerable. Tom, I was vulnerable because I forgot the importance of daily bread. Daily bread. In a world consumed with temptation, and all of us, by Christ's prayer, are still here in it, so that we know that what we have in Christ is enough to endure it and to praise him for it and see God's glory in it. We will endure it if we remember the beauty and the need for daily bread. Okay. Let me pray with you. Father, we thank you so much for your goodness. What a kind father. And I know that the aim for you, even having us live in a world uh, with a sinful nature that's covered by Christ, enduring a fallen world with its appetite uh, for sin, and even having a fallen nature that still has its own taste for it, your desire is for us to know you more intimately. And I thank you, Father, even for the times, Father, that... I let my fallen nature take over. Cut my hand over my ears to what is true. And sinned. I thank you, Father, that you uh, heard me and keep hearing me in repentance. And I thank you that you are a good Father. That you forgive that you still hold, that 
church teach. And Father, even with this proverb, you have been a, a caring Father because you know what we go through and you write it out to us. You also know, Father, what we have in you. And Father, what we experience when we just rest in that and trust you. So I pray, Lord, that you guide us and encourage us. Bring this to mind by your spirit to do that. To know what is true and to trust you. Father, none of this is possible without Christ. I praise you, Father, that in and through him, you redeemed us out of the slave market of sin. Sin is no longer our master. Christ is. I praise you that for that, Father. And as we take communion today, let us each, Father, who are your followers, be, be grateful to you for Christ. Lord Jesus, may we thank you for your sacrifice, your resurrection, and even your covering of us to this day. We praise you that we get to know you even in the challenges that you purpose. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name I pray. Use this time just to keep praying. There may be some things that surfaced from the text that you want to address with the Father. There may be things the Father brought to mind that weren't even in the text or the direction of the text, but you just know you need to have the conversation with Him. Do so right now before we have communion. And then delight in the reminder of all that Christ has done that you may have that conversation with the Father. Do that right now. And in just a moment, you'll get further instructions on communion.